let's let's do another episode on let's learn how to grind this tool today i wanted to talk about um chamfer end mill these are straight fluted four flute chamfer end mills out of carbide um, we usually run them at work in the cnc i run them them in my own cnc and also in a manual mill they're also useful for deburring small diameter holes without chatter by using them like a a burr by hand. A quick disclaimer, which I forgot in the first one or two episodes so far that I did on the tool grinding. I'm not an expert on tool grinding at all. Um, all my knowledge about tool geometry is either by looking at existing tools, try and error, and a little bit of book n reading books. So the ways I, I show how to grind tools are not textbook versions of tool grinding. Even if you look at two tool, two, two of the same style of tool from two different manufacturers, they probably have a different geometry. So there are many variables in tool grinding and a lot of things work. So take everything that I say here with a grain of salt or a large bucket of salt, maybe. So straight flute carbide chamfer end mills. As you can see, they have straight flutes, no spiral flute. You can get them with spiral flute too. They run very nice, but these are reasonably priced and very easy to regrind within limitations, which I will talk about later. You can regrind them on the deep bit grinder, surface grinder, tool and cutter grinder, or as usual, if you're brave, on the milling machine. I should, I should show that one day. <laughs> um, when regrinding these these cutters, we only grind the primary. They only have one relief. They only have a primary relief that's usually ten, about ten degrees. That's uh, hard to show. That's this flat here. We have to grind the flat a little bit back until this edge here nice and sharp again if they are damaged too much you have to grind back this flat here quite a bit and then you lose all of your flute i will i will also show how to reflute them how to to grind the flute deeper so you get even more life out of it you could even grind one of these on a tool and cutter grinder from solid stock very easily and I will show that too. Um, I already already did two to try it out. Uh, this was my first approach. Uh, the flutes are a little bit on the pathetic side. Um, could be deeper. But even this one will work, probably. Um, this one is the second one I ground. And this looks really good. Um, I couldn't get all the way into the tip because my diamond wheel has a little bit of an edge radius in here and you cannot reach down all the way to the tip but apart from that it looks really good and i will go in a minute to the milling machine and give this a shot when we grind them we want this edge here to be of an excellent grinding quality because the finish of this edge here translates directly to your surface finish as usually when you're cutting with a with, with the flute of an end mill. We start with a 10 millimeter deburr bit or chamfer end mill as they usually are called. Uh, holding it relatively short in a, in a 10 millimeter collet, first we set the tip angle of the cutter. Um, it's a 90 degree cham a 45 degree chamfer, so the included angle is 90. So we have to set this for 45. And down here we set the back uh, the, the relief angle and 10 degrees is what I could measure pretty much what a, a stock cutter has trying to hold up a protractor to a round cutter is quite hard okay I'm using a relatively fine wheel this is a usually I use a d125 diamond wheel and the, the, the number indicates the size of the diamond grain in microns. So a D125 is, has 125 
micron large uh, diamond grid. This is a D40, so each diamond grid on here is 40 micron in, in size. Now it's a matter of aligning uh, the cutter, or the, the, so the flutes are horizontal and square, to the spindle of the dividing head. And when I did this with the, with the twist drills, I, I used the square, uh, a scale over the cutting edge and I eyeballed it. But I found a slightly better way. It's still not perfect, but I'm working on it. I know I have a machine surface here on my on the swivel here and I will include a photo where I show how I machined this flat here. It has also a precision board six millimeter hole in the center which describes the center of rotation of this pivot joint here. Um, but I know that the height from here to the center of this indexing head here is 55.5 millimeters. So then it's easy. I can just use a scale. A scale is accurate enough here. And I can just... It would be nice if I could rotate it. Um, and I can just measure if I get this square on here. 55.5 and I can just align this outside edge, this outside corner of this cutting edge with the 55.5 millimeter mark on my scale. That's reasonably accurate. So basically what I'm going to do in future is I'm, I'm going to machine myself a spacer, grind it to 55.5 millimeter length and use that to rest one of the flutes of the cutter up against and then it's aligned. That's reasonably simple. And we can double check if we measure on this side over here. And that's 55.52. Again, a closer look to, to measure or to, to where to measure to. You can see that we hit this outside edge or corner of the cutting edge with the 55.5 millimeter mark uh, here. That's 50, 55, 55.5. And then it's aligned. That's reasonably simple. I like that. <laughs> as I said, learning as I go along. You never stop learning when you work in a shop. Uh, ready to grind. I brought it up here into almost contact with the grinding wheel. We can pass by the grinding wheel and I will bring my dust extraction in, my hose. And as usual, tool grinding is always a close quarter operation, so it might be hard to see something. I will grind the first flute with the setup and then I will zoom in a little bit. You saw me grinding all four uh, cutting edges and uh, with that the, the primary relief on this cutter and as you can see it looks pretty good. We lost the ability to cut very small diameter internal chamfers into a corner because the fluting ends the fluting is on an angle and if we grind the cutting edges back, the fluting doesn't reach into the tip all the way anymore. That's, the, that's a drawback on this technique. We still get a perfect point, so it's still easy to measure the length of the tool when you run a CNC machine. You don't have to use optics, you still can touch, touch off on the 
the extreme point out here. If you grind it with a flat on the end, you have to use the theoretical center point tip of the tool, which you can measure by opti with optics or you can measure somewhere, get also the diameter and then calculate back to the, to the theoretical tip. But that's annoying. Um, it's nice to have the ability to measure off the tip if you have a tactile measuring system in your CNC machine. If you have a bloom or initial laser, that's not a problem. It will do it for you. So yeah, we lost this ability of the cutter, but the cutting edges are nice and clean again. Nice and sharp, feeling really good. Um, the wheel that we used leaves a really very good finish. One thing, um, I, I'll calculate it or measure the 10 degree uh, back taper for a six millimeter deburring cutter. This is a 10 millimeter, so we have to check if our if our clearance angle here is enough so the cutter doesn't rub. And the way we do this, as usual, we bring in our dial test indicator all the way to the cutting edge. Give it a little bit of preload. This is a two micron dial test indicator, so this might be a little bit annoying. Find a real high spot here, which is in this case 90. Let's zero this out, might be easier. And then we check if it drops off constantly below the cutting edge. You see? It starts here at the maximum. This is the cutting edge. That's good. Then it drops, it drops. Each line are two microns. Drops, drops, even more. Uh, 100 microns, 120. Then we hit the spot where it starts to change. And here we have to be careful. Now it rises up back again. That's because we ground the taper on a round object. That. Uh, an angled surface on a, on a round object and that's just what happens when you spin it. Then it rises back up again to 40 microns so it stays 40 microns below the cutting edge. See? Zero, drops, drops, rises back, goes up to 40. So we have at the most extreme point, we have 40 microns of clearance between our, our material and the uh, primary relief surface. And then it just drops down in the cutting flute, which is fine. Uh, the small Noga indicator stand with a 2 micron indicator is not really the, the most repeatable setup. <laughs> oh, that's awful. Um, but yeah, you get, you get the idea. Um, when you ground a tool and you're uncertain if it's going to cut, check for clearance behind the cutting edge. And with an indicator, that's pretty easy to do, or with a dial test indicator in this case. I, I generally prefer dial test indicator over indicators any day long. If I could have only one, one of the two, it would be a dial test indicator. You will rarely see me use a, a normal indicator for several reasons. One, they are smaller, they are compact, you can reach into hard to reach areas. The measuring forces are very small. They do not have, or they have backlash, but it's very, very minute. Um, they're more sensitive, more accurate. They are just better, period. I know there are, there are many occasions when you want to use an indicator, for example, when you need to measure large travel, but in my mind, that's this is what you want for most things. I know there will be other opinions, but I don't care. But <laughs> uh, so, yep, yeah, let's go to the mill and do a test cut with this thing. Okay, there we go. Um, we're cutting brass at 3000 RPM.
I went a few times back and forth with different speeds of, uh, with different depth of cuts, but this really works quite well. Cuts nicely, very quiet, as you expect from a freshly sharpened cutter. Leaves a, leaves a very nice finish too. This was hand feeding. I think if I machine fed it, power fed it, it would even be nicer. There you can see a little bit of the marks that's characteristical for a straight flute cutter. Uh, tiny vertical lines. But overall it's pretty decent. I wouldn't mind to use that cutter. We're over at the tool and cutter grinder and I'm attempting that for I wanted to to cut those flutes in this 10 millimeter deeper end mill deeper, but I decided just to go to the under, other, other side of this end mill and grind the same contour as we have here on this side. So we do a full cutter from scratch. That shows how to grind the geometry quite well. The dividing head is aligned in the X or in the travel direction of my table, which is X on this grinder. It's tilted back 25 degrees, like this. And I have an ER25 collet chuck in here, which I'm going to use to hold this cutter. Torque it, click. I don't want the whole mess of, of carbide dust in this, uh, in this bearing collet nut. So I'm using a piece of aluminum foil or tin foil, depending on where you are, around around the collet chuck. Yeah, in a production environment you could do this, uh, would drive you crazy, but I'm not a, a production grinding shop, so I, <laughs> I can't do this. Get the grinding wheel, the edge of the grinding wheel centered over the center of my carbide blank. And now we're just grinding the flute into the, the carbide until we roughly hit the center of the blank or we overshoot it. Overshooting isn't the problem. Uh, not going far enough is also not a problem, but um, the cutter will in the end not cut all the way to the tip. So we try to get it as close or over center as possible. Uh, I'm going to take a fairly deep cut. Uh, I'm climb cutting. Wheel is going this direction, work is traveling this direction. This works because this grinder has a, uh, a cable drive for the table, uh, which is backlash free. And I'm running my, my fog buster with cutting oil to, to, to keep the cut clear, which is a blatant mess. That's also the reason why I have the aluminum foil here. So we set the, the indexing head here rotation wise to zero. Then, after grinding each flute, we will index 90 degrees. We're making a four flute cutter here.
So, grinding with oil is a is really messy, but as you saw, you can you can remove quite a bit of carbide in no time uh, when you have something that that keeps the cup cool and lubricates it. Okay, here's the carbide blank with the four flutes ground into it. And that's exactly what you would do to an existing deeper end mill to cut the flutes deeper. Exact the same procedure, only that you have to align the flute horizontal and pick up on the uh, vertical flat surface then. And then grind it deeper, go back to the deeper grinder and grind the 90 degree uh, tip angle with the relief. Or you can, of course, if you have a twin cutter grinder, but not a deep bit grinder, you can also grind the the 45 here on the twin cutter grinder or on a surface grinder. Okay, same setup as when we reground the chamfer end mill. I'm aligning the two two of the flutes horizontal by measuring the height of the surface here, and I get my 55.5 to the cutting edge on both sides. That means that it's horizontal. And I lock, I, I clamp it securely in the callout. And down here, I set the, the back relief. We're, this is a larger cutter, so we're going for, let's, let's try 20 degrees. We can later check, check uh, the back relief if it's enough. And bring it in position. Okay, that's a close-up of what we just ground, and I'm quite happy. Uh, this cutter will definitely work. We have to check the back rake, but I'm very confident that 20 degrees will be more than enough to get, to get enough clearance. As you can see, the flute here does not go all the way to the tip. And that's because of the corner radius that I have worn onto my grinding wheel. That just happens over time if you use it a lot. Um, I use this wheel also to grind stone. So um, it takes quite a beating in my shop. But if, if we had a sharp corner in here, if I had a, a second wheel that's, that has a completely sharp edge, I could pick out this edge or this corner and let the flute run all the way to the tip and make a, a deeper or chamfer end mill that cuts all the way, almost all the way to the tip. But it's, it's serviceable the way it is. Ow! Let's check the back taper or back relief. So got my two micron dial test indicator. I should use a, a coarser indicator for this purpose, but I don't want to change any of my other indicators over. So we have to make do. Um, high spot of the cutting edge is right here. As you can see, it hits zero pretty much. Then when we spin over the relief flat, it drops, drops, and drops completely off into the flute. So this cutter will work perfectly fine. It has more than enough back rake or back clearance, whatever you want to call it. So yeah, that, that was a complete grind from scratch. Um, these, these cutters really have a very simple geometry. You grind the flutes, you grind the, the included angle for the tip, whatever you want. If you want a specialized angle, go for it. You could regrind this to, to be a 30 degree chamfer or 60. Of course, you can buy uh, 45 or 90 in this case and 60. Those are standard angles. Uh, but if you want, if you need a, a 44.1 uh, degree chamfer, 
you can grind a cutter to match that. So there we go. I ground another chamfer end mill from scratch out of a piece of carbide scrap. And this time I made a three fluter. Um, grinds exactly the same way, only that you do a 120 degree uh, division. Uh, three flutes, three cutting edges, and three times the um, primary relief. Of course, this one doesn't take as much feed as it has one cutting edge less. But apart from that, it, it will just work as fine as the four flute one. You could, it's basically always, it's, it's basically a chamfer, a, a D bit with more than one cutting edge. It's a really a, that simple geometry. And this one is not a 90 degree, this is a 120 degree tool because I wanted to try, try it for centering, center spot drilling. And it kind of works. I'm not entirely happy yet with how it works. That's all the tooling I ground in the process of this video. Um, we reground the 10 millimeter one, we made a new 10 millimeter one, I ground a 121 with three flutes from scratch, uh, reground these two 90 degree cut tools and I made uh, this one here, six millimeter four flute also from scratch. And this one, which is quite useless because it has very small flutes. But now I understand the geometry behind these tools way better than before. As you can see, when you look, this is commercial grind. Ugh. When you look at the shape of the flute, like here with the radius, back here where it tapers out, and my grind, same shape, uh, that looks very similar. So uh, I think I. I, I got it pretty darn good. So I hope you learned something. Thank you all for watching and see you next time.